everyone. Welcome to episode number 642 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. Bill Gates once said, certainly there's a phenomenon around open source. You know free software will be a vibrant area. There will be a lot of neat things that get done there. And folks, this week we are talking all about some really neat things. That's right, we're talking all about open source development with Julie Chen and engineering leader Tim Jurovich from Deloitte. Tim, Julie, and I are chatting all about this open source revolution, the biggest challenges of open source development today, and where the open source road is headed in the future. Also this week, I check out a super cool new collaboration called the Moon Rice Project that aims to develop the perfect crop for sustaining life in space for long-duration missions. But first, please welcome Julie and Tim to Fish Fry. Hi, Tim. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Really excited to be here. Excellent. And hi, Julie. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Amelia. Great to be um, on your podcast with my colleague, Tim, here. Fantastic. Okay, so Julie, we're talking about the open source revolution. So first, talk to me about the movement toward open source development and where this movement stands today. Yes, absolutely. So open source development has gained tremendous traction over the past few years. We're seeing it be embraced by not just the tech companies, but companies across all industries, even some of the more regulated ones like financial services and healthcare. Traditionally, companies may have explored open source more from the cost angle, so reducing technology's total cost of ownership. But now adoption of open source is just as much about agility and innovation. If a company tries to innovate exclusively internally, it's never going to scale as fast as if it had the open source community behind it. By releasing something into the open source community, they can get broader input, faster iteration, and more adoption. Now, open source is part of how any company operating in a digital space builds credibility. Awesome. So, Julie, what do you think are the biggest challenges of open source development today? Yes. So the biggest challenge is that it's in everything. We can't avoid it, but we have to be very careful about how we use it. And Tim, I know you've had some experiences with your clients. Maybe you can talk about those. Absolutely. You know, open source really has been around since the beginning of the internet, as we started to think about how people aren't recreating the wheel as they create new software. So any modern application could have a few hundred modules that are from open source, and that's actually considered quite low. There are some that are in thousands. And when we really look at that, it ultimately comes down to the risk and reward. There's a lot of different versions, compatibility issues, and really vulnerabilities, which we're we're starting to see more even now with Gen AI, where malware can be introduced in older packages, Gen AI tools might recommend older packages. And really, this really comes into the good and the bad of open source. And ultimately, there's inherently so much good there, but there's also, it creates an area for improper usage. And it's a challenge just in how fast it's growing and really how many different technologies are in the midst now. All right. So what do you think developers can do to help navigate these issues? And how do you think we can improve open source development as a whole? First, I think it starts with having a clear and intentional open source strategy. You can't go into this space with a we'll figure it out later mindset. You need to understand both the upside and the potential risks and be honest about them. A lot of problems happen when companies assume they're covered without setting any clear policies. But the community is sophisticated. So if your open source strategy is weak or thrown together, people will see through it right away. So you need to be clear about your goals, your boundaries, and how you're leveraging open source, but also how you're contributing to the community. 
And I'll share that one of the main things there is the balance of governance is critical. There's also the challenge of stifling development and, and really slowing that down. As we talk about all of these applications requiring open source modules, there's also some governance and policies that we've seen out there where in order for a new release to be brought through from an open source package, it requires senior executive approval. That's really not sustainable, especially at the pace of development that we see out there. So it's the ultimate balance between more oversight and more trust. All right. So can you share some current applications you're seeing? Sure, absolutely. It goes without saying that open source is everywhere. And especially for enterprise clients, there's more and more building happening now than there ever has been. And that's because they need to take ownership of their experience, of their journey. And when they're doing that, they're ultimately relying more and more on open source technology on top of large enterprise systems. So they could put their secret sauce into their experience while relying on some of the time-tested and really bulletproof open source technology behind the scenes. One of the, the main things here is that we're really seeing the open source community rally behind what does it take to create great software? So in the open source world, we're seeing vulnerability scans, package updates, the dependency trees. We're seeing all of that happen in open source technology. So now every enterprise is also following that same pattern. So the developer experience from you know, what we're seeing in open source is really starting to mirror what enterprises are doing now too. All right. So Tim, where do you see the open source movement headed in the future? And, you know, from my perspective, it's only going to grow. No question. Open source is used inherently in everything. And now it is much more challenging to say, I own a technology or I own this piece of software, this language. Inherently, it is all built on the same underpinnings. So we'll see this in hardware, software, gaming, in many different places. It will also get messy. The more you rely on open source, the more you need to understand really what's happening behind the scenes. You can trust open source, but you also need to verify that it's doing what it should expect to do. I mean, many companies are really working through how to realize those benefits while managing the risks. But you know, in my mind, it's only going to continue to grow. Julie, what about you? Yeah, I, what's incredible is that we're seeing many companies invest in open source at unprecedented levels. So there's definitely momentum behind this movement. Even so, I think there are both forces that accelerate the growth of open source and on the other hand, forces that are moderating the growth of open source. In the first category, stronger standards and greater interoperability will continue to drive greater adoption of open source, including by enterprises, as Tim mentioned. And AI is, of course, the greatest accelerator. It's enabling rapid development on a scale we've never experienced before. For moderating forces, though, we do think that the software supply chain might become much more complex and more vulnerable if the right safeguards are not in place. That makes sense. So talk to me about the potential of open source. Yeah, we think the potential is enormous. What I'm most excited about is how open source will drive innovations in some of our toughest technical challenges today, including in agriculture, pharma, cybersecurity, and the likes. With the power of open source, ideas will scale at a pace that no single team could ever drive and build trust, resilience, and standardization in a way that closed ecosystems just can't. The movement towards open source and software is ushering in a new era of system-wide collaboration in education, research, science, and public infrastructure. But to unlock that potential, you've got to approach it intentionally. Yeah, and I'll share from my perspective, Gen AI has been a great push towards the, the change in the software development lifecycle. And one of the biggest areas in which we're seeing really bleeding edge innovation is in open source. When you think about you know, code generation from designs or automating an experience, really that is happening within open source. So it is a playground where, where new ideas are coming out, they're building in the open, and it's really starting a dialogue around where should things go? So that is one of the things I'm most excited about from a speed standpoint. I'd also say from a legitimacy standpoint, you know, we're seeing more and more enterprises show up in the open source community. And that's ultimately because it is a proof point. 
there's a lot that happens behind the scenes in an organization, but open source allows you the chance to bring some trust, credibility, show what's going on behind the scenes and really show what we believe in from a structure, from a culture and from a quality standpoint. So I'm really excited about both that innovation within the, the Gen AI and software development lifecycle, as well as just the legitimacy that it's bringing to organizations when they're very vocal within the open source communities. I love that. All right. Well, you guys, it is time for your off the cuff question. So here we go. If you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there. What would you have? Amelia, I love that the question is about food, um, and I'll volunteer myself to go first. I would love to have my grandmother's handmade dumplings. Uh, I'm Chinese, and so dumplings are my go-to comfort food, um, and my grandmother's dumplings are the best. She's not with us anymore, so I'd have to travel geographically and backwards <laughs> in the space-time continuum, but that's what I would have. I love that. And what about you, Tim? Well, you know, one of the things uh, when I first met my wife, uh, there was a conversation of, hey, what's your favorite food? And my answer was chicken, which is the most boring answer ever. Um, but what, I, what I'll elaborate with is um, if, I, if I could have this meal every day and I had it every day for a few years, it would be a chicken teriyaki from Magic Teriyaki Number no. 3 in Seattle. Um, <laughs> very, very basic, but, you know, there's something really, um, you know, special about food in that way that it brings you back to that time in your life. So that's my, it's my go-to every time. I love it. Fantastic. Well, this was super cool. Thank you so much for joining me, Julie and Tim. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have you heard about the Moon Rice Project? Okay, so the issue at the center of this new research is growing our own food for long-term space missions. Yes, the future of any kind of sustained space habitation is going to depend on our ability to grow our own food. And this new project aims to develop the perfect crop for sustaining life in space by using cutting-edge experimental biology. So, this collaboration, which includes the Italian Space Agency and three Italian universities, including the University of Milan, which has a very strong background in rice genetics, the University of Rome, Sapienza, which specializes in the manipulation of crop physiology, and the University of Naples, which has a long history in space crop production, has been working on the most perfect rice for space for quite a long time now. Okay, so let's back up a second and talk about the challenges of growing crops in space. Now, one of the biggest hurdles is the size of the crops. The current size of crops grown on Earth are absolutely too large to be grown reliably in space. Even many dwarf varieties of rice are still too big. Dr. Del Bianco, plant biologist at the Italian Space Agency, explains this issue like this. Dwarf varieties often come from the manipulation of a plant hormone called gibberellin, which can reduce the height of the plant, but also creates problems for seed germination. They're not an ideal crop. Because in space, you just don't have to be small, you must also be productive. So, after almost five years of research, this team has some very promising results. First, researchers at the University of Milan isolated mutant rice varieties that can be grown to just 10 centimeters high. And at the same time, the University of Rome identified genes that can alter the plant architecture to maximize production and growth efficiency. In addition, Dr. Del Bianco and their team are also looking into enriching the protein content of rice by increasing the ratio of protein-rich embryo to starch. 
Dr. Del Bianco also has a unique personal focus here as well. That being better understanding how rice plants cope with microgravity. They explain this issue like this. We simulate microgravity on Earth by continually rotating the plant so that the plant is pulled equally in all directions by gravity. Each side of the plant gets activated continuously and it doesn't know where the up and down is. It's the best we can do on Earth because, unfortunately, doing experiments in real microgravity conditions, i.e. in space, is complex and expensive. But moon rice isn't just about space exploration. This team also contends that this research could have useful applications for growing crops in controlled environments on Earth as well. Cool, right? So the overall motivation here is to help better serve our astronauts. As Dr. Del Bianco explains, if we can make an environment that physically and mentally nourishes the astronauts, it will reduce stress and lower the chances of people making mistakes. In space, the best case of a mistake is wasted money, and the worst case is the loss of lives. <laughs> I love this so much. So if you want more information about Deloitte or the Moon Rice Project, I've included a bunch of links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow me or us on LinkedIn as well. And we are on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me, and our animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, -E at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of July 25th, 2025, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.